and, and video games. So I will hand over to you, uh, Greg, for, for a couple minutes. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's awesome to be able to join. Well, this is my first ever Twitch stream, and uh, I got asked to join. And here I am. I'm going to figure it out as I go. But it is such a, a cool and important idea for us to talk about housing, which is, impacts our everyday lives and is really one of the main issues we know are impacting just everyday people. Uh, when I first got onto the city council, the very first phone calls we got was from people in a mobile home community who technically own their homes, but had the land under them bought by a big out-of-state company. They started raising their rents illegally, started wanting to kick them and push them out. Um, and when we looked up this company, they had actual quotes in the newspaper from these investors say, buying mobile home parks is like buying waffle houses where the customers are chained to the booths because they could raise rents and people couldn't leave. Um, because they always own their homes, but they just couldn't own the land. And that's just such an example of the kind of big system uh, that we were just talking about. And so um, we have to make, really talk about it and think about to think about how ridiculous some of these rules are uh, for us to ever be able to change. SWV audio of, uh, uh, capture not registered. Down. But the good news out of that terrible and sad beginning of the story was we actually came together. Um, brought advocates like Texas Housers, take our along as lawyers that block some of the legal evictions. And we came together as an entire community in Austin and passed an affordable housing election to put more public funds towards housing. We made some of those available for cooperatives. And so that same group of neighbors came together um, and applied for some of that funding. And they pushed back hard enough against those investors. The investors said, okay, we'll sell you know, because we don't really want to deal with it all anymore. Um, and they were actually able to buy back their land, now run it as a cooperative, set their own rent, their set their own destiny, and they've created, shown that there's their model and other ways of thinking about housing. Um, and and I hope that that's part of what we're going to get to talk about as we play this game. Just, you know, I, I love games, especially board games and then old school video games that I grew up with. And uh, just from looking a little bit, I thought, oh, it looks like it's got some of that vibe. So I'm excited to check it out. Cool. All right, Evan, I'll turn it over to you for, uh, for a couple of minutes so you can kind of talk about what you've been doing and, and your involvement with like acting in dot home. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm a bit of a homo. You know, one of the things that always uh, stopped me considering it was that kind of inherent knowledge of, like how you said, Chris, before the systems being rigged, you know, like, I knew that there was inherent unfairness baked into the lending institutions and some of the policies and um, other kind of. Uh, Gates that have to reckon with to own the home. So, you know, uh, SWB audio capture that, that, not registered. Game, you know, like what decisions a person has to make to um, actually um, you know, like, um, get things within all these, within these, and outside entities um, in order to just get the chance to, to get on a home. You know, so, you know, and as far as my involvement with the game start, you know, uh, you and I met uh, what two or more years ago at this point? Yeah, two years um, ago. And uh, we, we, you know, you put me working on this game, but um, uh, you know, I said yes, yeah, despite the fact of uh, being busy and whatnot, because you know, the, the animating kind of purpose for the game we that I believe in so much. Um, interrogating these you think you know who can live in certain places what are the factors have to kind of navigate and get to that point so you know it's so rare that talk about this kind of an issue in your game like earnestly um without cynicism and you kind of curiosity so um to me that was the thing to say yes yeah yeah. And I will say that Evan uh, is is sort of, you know, a big deal because in the span of the two years, I learned that he was putting on the 
guest from Spider-Man Miles Morales game that came out and during um, comic book and I have my very own signed copy of Rise of Black Panther by Anarsis. So um, kind of a big deal. Um, people might not, maybe, maybe everyone might not, you know, know that, but I just wanted to put it out there. Um, I wanted to stop here in this game, in, in game.com, if you're, if you're looking at it. Um, I stopped in this place where he wrote about cat for keys. Um, I don't, do you, do you see these, like, magazines of cat for keys? Everywhere in Austin. No, and, and I, I saw how, you know, I think it's grandma here in the game was mentioning how people call too. Yeah. And, um, and you know, they're, they're basically, you know, a lot of time folks need the money and they're, you know, massively undervaluing the, the homes and it's a quick take advantage of people. And, uh, and we see it just everywhere, especially uh, in sort of gentrified areas where these investors think that they can you know, make a bunch of money on uh, on a flip. Uh, and so I that's part of some of this conversation is going to go, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, um, you know, this game is set in Detroit. Um, what some of the development team, they're, they're born and raised in Detroit, and um, so we wanted to sort of bring it home to them. Um, so that's why we chose the setting, but it's also so, um, such an, an important place to talk about housing, the great migration. Um, housing booms and busts and exclusion and um, predatory real estate practices that continue to this day. Um, so all that is, is in this game, no spoilers here, but um, all of that is in the game. It's something that I wanted to talk a little bit more um, with you about, Greg, is the idea of um, community controlled land and housing. So at this point in my in my work life, I work for a national organization called Power Switch Action, um, and one of our big tenets is um, community controlled land and housing. But something that I'm hearing people on our, in our base, you know, black and white people, who say like, I don't want to do any co co ownership. Like I want my chance at the American dream. I've been denied and excluded from this for so long. This is important to me. Like I can't get on board with social housing, community controlled land and housing and like shared stewardship of land and housing. And and to that, I'm like, you know, that's a good point. This stuff's messy and hard to crack. Um, yeah, like what do you what do you what have you heard about the sort of like narrative and I don't know, what do we do about it? Yeah, I mean, in a world where folks are so used to a system screwing them over all the time, you know, or we're selling you something that sounds like a really good idea and it never turns out right. Like cash for your early house, for example. Right. I think it takes like a lot of trust um, and and a lot of guardrail. And then sometimes people still aren't gonna buy into that and that's that's okay. Right. But hope is I think that you have to show some places where it does work. Some networks places where you have some folk that, that show that it's worth it. And then you you go in on that and to learn what people's you know real concerns are um so you know i never I, I never blame folks for that but maybe figuring out places where um where you can get it done makes sense so you know an example is we have a big piece of city owned property in east austin historically black community now it's an overwhelming immigrant and brown and community in st john and the city bought that land to put a courthouse and a police station there um which is the wrong thing for that neighborhood you know it's a place where folks needed affordable housing and parks and child care and you know all, all those sorts of things to support a neighborhood and we came together and demanded that and we we're getting that done and currently nobody lives there because it's an abandoned old home deep big box store parking lot mm -hmm. and if we can establish some more sort of social housing options and um and more you know, publicly on land to have you know or income and working class home ownership opportunities, um, and you bring folks in on that, they can maybe really show that work there and then find other places where it can spread. Um, instead of necessarily coming up to somebody and say, hey, can we transform your home into this thing? Um, you know, maybe showing where it works and showing that it can work in a neighborhood first might be one way, you know, of, of making it so that, you know, progressives with a more progressive vision of housing don't get mixed up as lookalike somebody else that's trying to sell people um, on something that they don't know it's to serve them or, or it's self-serve. Totally. Yeah. 
Um, I wanted to pause the part of the game because I love the relationship between Mavis, Grandma Mavis, and Dot. Um, and a lot of care was taken in writing these characters. Um, I want you to talk about sort of like why we decided to tell a family story, um, Evan, and, and talk about like who these characters are. Yeah, you know, um, things when you're dealing with a topic like this, and just this, to me, you know, access to things that are all really heavy, right? Um, thing to me, you know, when I talked about this was that these um, cycles, periods out there, they were okay, one way to them have um, this injustice persists over time is to look at it through the lens of a multi family, right? So we have Dot here talk to her mother and she talks about why she left the place that she called home to try and find another one. And, um, you know, the, what it means to her because once you establish the idea that it's their mission, that then we talk about have some kind of emotional work to it. We have strong emotional to our homes, right? And, you know, we think about why have the opportunities to even live there. Um, look, examining that through the lens of one family um, was one of our ideas. And you see where we hear Dot, we see Dot to um, her nephew Carlos, you know? And this place means something to him too. Um, it's about some, a place alone in this dialogue to be And uh, oh, that's a real thing. Uh, uh, when you have a home, share with uh, people, like all kinds of um, meaningful um, connection and, and, and honestly power um, comes from that, you know, the institutional power, you know, you can't vote if you don't have my address, you know, in some places. And um, so this is all a family franchise by. So that's the reason we want to think about um, um, the story of the lens of one family. Yeah. Totally. Um, I, am I correct in thinking you were born and raised in Austin? No, I was actually born in Houston. Oh. Oh. Yeah. How about I was born and raised in South Texas in Laredo. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I like the idea of home is so important to me. It's like why I do something just work. Um, but the way we all come to, to like having work is super interesting. So um, I'm going to ask you, Greg, like, you've well, been out for a long time. Like, home, it's, I, uh, you know, my family grew up in Chico. I grew up in Houston. My grandmother was actually born in Boston. Mm -hmm. um, but, and that's because my great grandmother from Mexico, uh, when, you know, there was the Mexican Revolution happening, uh, and her husband was fighting and, and she wanted to be safe, walked, you know, our family stories that walk, go or do whatever, to go to Basel where a lot of folks were going to, and that's where my grandma was born. Um, and actually, it was, you know, her dad was killed, and then they went back. And then, you know, the parents grew up here, and then they went to, back to Texas. And so, in some ways, right, there is, you know, that long, that importance of multi generation long staying in one place mm. form of home and then also you know people move uh and we have to be able to find a way to sort of accept and incorporate how do we protect people's sense of home when they really have ownership over a place and then we also recognize that like all these boundaries and, and border are made up things and folks are always in search of of the better place or a place to establish their family or reestablish themselves or so kept holding both that people move, and we have to protect that import, the importance of people being able to move and and settle and create a home, and then also how to push back against things like gentrification and colonization, uh, and sort of the exploitation of, of land. So how do you do both? I think is also a really important. Yeah, part of really. It reminds me, I I um, wouldn't be a good uh, houser if I didn't bring Texas housers for rights. So right to stay. Um, in the face of impending development, in the face of neighborhood changes, in the face of like economic challenges, right to stay, the right to choose 
um, way to live that suits your needs. Um, the right to equal treatment. So same infrastructure for everybody, rich or poor, black or white. And where you are in the city, you have the same access to flood protection and uh, you know, climate justice, um, the clean air, uh, high quality housing. Um, so the right to equal treatment and the right to have a say, to not just the superficial, like I vote, I have my say, but like the actual belief and trust that your voice matters in government um, and that your voice matters in where you live. So um, a lot of that is incorporated in the, in the game. So I, you know, I want Evan to talk about sort of like the the choice sets that are in front of the player when they're they're walking with Dad's family throughout this whole experience and like the whole history. Like, you know, talk about choices, like the choice you make in games and like how that that applies to sort of the choice you have to make when you're choosing your house, neighborhood, all that stuff. Yeah, so you know, uh when you when you and I first spoke, Chris, uh, you said that the reasons you really want to make a game about this subject matter is because the games let you choose and let you control things, you know. Um, it's some way that you can agree with, right? So, um, you know, one of the things we want to explore in the game was uh, what choices are available to Dot's family member. You know, the kind of main conceit of the game is that Dot has to let her travel the time she wants in the houses of different family members and different points in their life. So, um, she sees grandmother and father um, in Detroit uh, in the 90s, uh, trying to find a place to live, trying to find a place that they can probably own. Um, and um, the choices that are available to her grandmother and grandfather as young people, she gets to witness them firsthand. You know, do we get a deal for this house? And we own it, but if we move the pain, goes back to bank. Or do we do we still try to own something outright? So this is, um, you know, later her uh, uh, uncle has to think about, okay, do I stay in these two projects? Do I leave the way to build me and kind of collective power in, in meaningful way to change our circumstances? But yeah, it's, it's the interest is a mechanic is so good, you know games are built systemically and um you know can be illustrate some um a lot in a really powerful way and you know seeing the choices that are in our goal you know spoiler consequences choices to the game um we thought you know, having a can it was a really powerful way to talk about um circumstances as they have like, yeah, totally. Um, I want to want to like get a little wonky here for a second. Um, we saw the game. We saw uh, Mr. Murphy um, come in and walk in and say, "Like, let me buy this house." You know, this whole cash for keys scheme. Um, and you know, it, it it's very clear, like an inviting didn't you were supposed to as a player i mean i want to tell people how to feel but we we wrote it so people are like oh like, that's a little intrusive that's you know that's predatory real estate guy what's his deal but he just walked right to the house yeah. like i heard you talking and then it's like oh suddenly there's the guy yeah yeah um but this is like a thing that's happening in, in austin like these these folks are coming in and, and um and sort of like preying on communities and, and it is a contributing reason to why Austin's housing punch is what it is, but it's not it's not the only reason. Um, you know, it's a lot of other things like tech companies moving in and, and speculating and lots of people want to live here because this is so great. There's also remnants of racist zoning like practices. Um, there's also like a lot of you know, maybe resistance to building housing for everyone. So, you know, what, I mean, what is the responsibility of local government in issues like this, where like these guys like Ms. Murphy can just like walk on in and, and pray on communities? What, what's the local government do? Yeah, I mean, part of what has to be done is what the things that should have been done for a generation up now, but 
the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago when the second best time is today. So we have to learn from that and start working on some of it today. My former colleague on the council, Betty Garza, is now a county attorney, actually identified some of the practices that we saw from Mr. Murphy, the third or whatever thing was. Um, and we actually have like now an education program to set up information to people about these sorts of, of themes. And we have that in Austin as sort of as our sort of families not flippers program. Uh, because of course people have their first amendment right to come and say stuff to you, maybe not the right to bar straight into your house. Um, but but that also the city has I think the responsibility to inform folks about about some of this. But that's just sort of treating the issue well after you're in in the problem. And so part of what we're starting to figure out how to do is how can we make things better in the city. How is it that we're addressing housing at the core part of that matter of what? Uh, and I'll just tell you one quick story in my district, you know, I was talking to a neighbor knocking on their door off of North Lamar Boulevard, just north of 183. Um, and folks said to me, you know, the most dangerous thing, you know, no matter how much on the news it says that we're in a dangerous neighborhood, the most dangerous thing is crossing North Lamar to get to the transit stop, to get to the transit center, uh, to go to work. To dodging his cars is the most dangerous thing I do every day in this neighborhood. Can you put a light in? But is there a way for you to put a traffic light in and for nobody to figure it out? Because once it's that better, I'm afraid of what it'll do to my land value. <laughs> no, I'm afraid of what it'll do on the housing price side. People are put in this terrible situation of do we make things better in working class neighborhoods on infrastructure, address flooding, you know, make transportation better, bring mass transit. But then is that going to be ultimately for not working class people anymore because you brought those things in themselves? That's this possible choice. And that's led sometimes to progressive folks on the housing front feeling torn or even opposed to good things because you because there isn't the displacement effort alongside it. So part of what we really pushed for in this new mass transit election, where we're going to have a subway through downtown and then connecting train and bus lines throughout the city is $300 million anti-displacement fund to help owners and renters along those lines so that you can get access and to help the transportation sides and the lower housing cost of maybe not needing two cars, not the housing cost overall, monthly cost of not having two car payments, but also to make sure we can keep people nearby. That's part of how we have to start thinking where, you know, if we're gonna make park investments, we should make parks investments alongside affordable housing investments in the US parks. You know, if we are going to do improve the environment, we should make sure we're improving the environment for everybody. And that's just not the way that local government has usually been built to work. It's usually been saying, let's build the parks, let's add the nice stuff, and let's invest in jails and then in filling those jails, um, rather than let's invest in making things better for people and then in keeping people there and housed rather than you know dealing with that through you know the biggest parts of local government budgets which tends to be policing and bailing so that's a big part of the shift that we kind of need to make um and are still process making in austin for a lot of people it was like that shift is happening too late um but we can't give up on the city we have to now and on the federal level equality is a huge part of it right i mean when you have folks working still in the service industry for bucks an hour or even less than a minimum wage just with but then surviving on tips. And then you have these jobs that are just making such extraordinary amounts and then CEOs making extraordinary, extraordinary amounts above that. Then you're going to naturally see the housing market. And the Texas legislature has banned us from raising the minimum wage for everybody in the city. They, the Supreme Court in Texas recently blocked our pay sick time laws in the middle of the pandemic. So in so many ways, we really do need federal action um to be able to sort of take some on and close inequality you know tax these extreme profits that we see and put that back into things like housing affordability uh, because it's not that people can't afford their home it really is that the companies are making money hand over fist right now are not paying people sufficiently for that um so that's part of the shift that's part of them making the move from the city council seat to running for federal office because we have to make change the local level and that federal level. And the last thing you said about zoning is huge. I mean, right now, a lot of Austin's policy is pointed towards 
the scraping of one little house and turning it into one bigger house. That's kind of what we encourage. Or the tearing down of an apartment complex and replacing it with another one and a more expensive one instead of adding new housing that we need in ways that aren't so gentrified, um, which we can do, but our laws just are not geared not geared that way. Um, so that, that was wonky. That was kind of three wonky <laughs> response to that. Public investment in housing, point one. Um, clothing inequality, especially on wages, point two, it's all tied together. And then third, you got to talk about zoning. I mean, we need more housing and we need that more housing in a way that isn't kind of being built in the worst ways. Elected officials are going to elect it officially, you know, I, I hear you. <laughs> And you are invited to the thing. I would mean, love to know. Maybe whatever was happening here on the video game was more uh, I'm, engaging. We invited we invited you for reads because we want to hear all these all these ideas and these good points. Um, so I'm I'm glad you've brought all that up. It's um, and 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 put it up so well and clean. So good stuff. Um, and. I want to, you are not from Austin, you are not a native text, and you, um, you grew up in New York, um, but you talked to me a lot about sort of like your struggles with living in Austin and just like you're seeing a kid here and you're just like, you know, like, is this the community you want to raise a kid in? Is that, is that a thing? So yeah. I'm talk about that. You don't mind. I'm telling you my business. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but you know, like there's a there's been a bit of culture shock for me in my time in Austin, and um, it has felt you know so different the way I grew up. And some of the things that Greg was talking about, like I've experienced firsthand how they can um, change um, your living circumstances. So like some robust math fans, right? Like you know, I grew up subways that ran twenty four hours can take anywhere. We New York City, which means, you know, you have opportunities to live and work in different parts of the of big metropolis. Um, circumstances, you know, like um, when, when you don't have to worry about as much of the cost of getting around individually, obviously you have more opportunities, right? And that's where I grew up, you know, um, which is to say it isn't massive income in, in quality in New York City, course there is, but like, uh, it just felt um, it makes definitely, you, you have such a housing density. But also, you know, the thing uh, Austin is like, uh, you know, density does feel very um, stratified and you know, it feels like, you know, you see the tower going and down, right? And, and, Houses been flipped and bought is often, but you know you get outside the, the inner ring and see that coming equal. You know roads that are less uh, well maintained, shops and um, you know community uh, that kind of stuff where I'm like okay, there is um, a mechanism work that does like paper is big, but like Greg said, paper is these bigger entities, you know, and um, again, you see New York City, I think sort of the density plays like, like seeing and meeting people from all life and all cultural backgrounds. And I don't know if you only get there, you only really get to reach the diversity by um, have a system from all walks of life to really interact with in a way. Totally. That's for like libraries. <laughs> like libraries are some, it's like one yeah. of my one of my favorite it is like legit my favorite city service ever. It's it's like I get free books uh, that I share with people and don't like sit on my shelves. But also like I go to the library and my neighbors are there, but also people who I don't know, like I don't see walking around here. They're they're folk who are houseless or need the resources and need, you know, need a place to hang out and, and read for jobs, like communicate with loved ones. Um, and it's like, I I love libraries for the reason. It's like very, the big indicator of like what community can and should be. That's my, my soapbox here. 
yeah, I mean, but, well, but honestly, I right? Like, I, yeah, I mean, like, Austin has a lot of working class folks in the city, it's majority of people of color, but it just is so segregated in a kind of different way than a lot of other places, right? Um, not like as pizza slice segregated, where you're kind of going through one kind of neighborhood and then you use another one and then another one on your way, right? People can sometimes just be able to be in their own bubble. Um, and that's something that yeah, it isn't good for the city. It's not good for the city's sort of community spirit. Um, but I do think that mass transit is a key, a key part of that, as you mentioned, you know, you know, it, it this isn't as segregated with the bus, um, um, but it's you know, way more segregated when your car just in a distance between places and all that. Um, that's a big, big challenge. The economic segregation of the city has been ranked, you know, one of the highest of almost anywhere in the country. Um, uh, I, and I think it's one thing that we really have to take on. I will, I will flag here that we are in, uh, we back in time in the course of playing this game. We went to the 1950s, so you hear a little Motown music from Detroit, get it? Um, <laughs> we're, we're in 1950s where Detroit Red Blonde, this young grandma Mavis and her husband Carl. Um, this, this is a chapter that Ed worked on with, with people in our, in our uh, cohort, in our native cohort. Um, but I, so I just wanted to like give you a chance Evan, to talk about some of the things that you learned while writing this chapter of the game. Um, it was fun, like, one of the things that I talk about when I talk about this game is that, like, is the things that I knew about, you know? Like, writer sometimes this image where, like, oh, I know everything, um, you know, and, uh, um, you're like your authority and stuff. Sometimes you you write things to learn about um, the world around. Right? So I never knew what DDU was before playing this game. You know, right, rather writing is you know, and I never knew what really was um, working on this game. So D kind of some contracts that um, a lot of hoods built on, like um, some of that, right? And, and even if I knew about something like a regional culture country uh, in the past, I didn't still exist, you know? And um, sometimes this language is just big into documents that you need to like sign to own a home. So uh, that, um, um, so I learned about the trophy when this game is set, you know? Like, you don't think a place of this is a place that floods, you know, like there's all kinds of climate equity um, in the city. And you know, we have a, a top point in the game where Carlos suffers from asthma and loves to hang out in the basement, but it gets flooded and it gets moldy after his home. You know, so learning about control that we're, um, there's all this mythology about real estate there. You know, oh, they're giving away homes in Detroit. Well, who's home? What? How did, how did, how did it want? being in the market, you know, who I was encouraged by. It. So those kind of things when I learned doing research uh, along with the other writers, you know, Amir Blosser, Peter Jason, who worked the game with too. Um, and uh, it really opened my eyes as to how some of these systems work and, and what I've been aware of before. Yeah. Um, here, we're going to near our closing time. So I'm going to like, keep playing if you the two of you um want to kind of like wrap up some of your your thought game or just the stuff we talked about um you know we're we've got a lot of things so uh greg i'll let you um let you kind of give some close reflections or thoughts on game housing austin serving of community yeah it was awesome talking y'all and i want to get a chance to to play more of the game uh myself and so I'm, I'm really interested sort of having what is your main takeaways are from um as you guys made it and scripted and wrote it i just like uh, this has been such a good start but i feel like i'm still yearning for some more here with our last few minutes uh you know one of the things that i think was been and challenging is not time to try and tackle was what, like multiple points of view about housing who 
blood who dots older houses, you know, like real estate. Um, so when we explore because okay, um, she has a sense of on her own, you know, creating wealth for her family and something that might be at this time. She talked about the she has and her her grandmother had for so you know, like, you know within you know like the the, the prototypical like Thanksgiving foundation conversation what's going to come with grandma's house oh you know, like that's what I'm talking about and considered when we're playing game of rather writing the you don't say playing oh uh, I did write I wrote about it um, <laughs> yeah so you know that that those kind of conversation like thinking about like get sort of the lens of not only really drama but also like systemic injustice um so i think you know the world has like i think more capacity and more clarity as to how these these uh, systems work and you know like we know everything we look different our conversations and create awareness of these systems and these choices um then you, know, you might have had you might not have before playing the game yeah, totally. And I will say that, you know, in in, in thinking up and dreaming up to our home, we, we, we did try, it's not necessarily about delivering the correct way to view housing, but the idea of lifting up collectivism and community. And, you know, when I was working on the game, like I, I had a baby, I'm I pregnant, I had a baby, I like uh, bought a house, like I, all of these things that are very much, you know, like themed the game uh, that we incorporated, you know, not just experiences, but those of other folks who worked on it. And it just it made me think about how there are not alternatives like there isn't a system in which like i'm not participating in the rat race that the office real estate market for example like, there aren't alternatives um and just working on the game and thinking about my values and stuff i'm like you know how can i like, sell my house to the city so it becomes a land trust and like the the price to, like the price doesn't get higher you know all of these like how can I be part of the solution um and about my values of house and land um challenge me to think about that. I don't know. Well, I think that that's like a really cool point here because, you know, there is like these characters all living in the constrained system that is built. Uh, and you think of as those are just the choices people have to make this constrained system. But it also gives you a sense of like who the, you know, what these real life choices are in the world would be like the different in it. Because a lot of times in housing policy, we're like, well, there's really constrained housing supply and uh, you know expensive for the city a lot of people wanting to live there that some people will go and drive up housing prices nearby and other more struggling places and that's how people talk about it so often in housing policy world but what it really means is like man somebody is trying to move because they got a divorce and they have more money and now they're you know going to a broker and that broker is hiring somebody that maybe wears that three piece suit or whatever <laughs> and jacking up price and then we'll have to have a thanksgiving conversation about what the right things to do for their family and so maybe if you actually think about all the human conversations that have been your life okay if we were to read the script what would be a better way when someone's gotten a divorce and is moving to a city how it is that they can be included and fit in without triggering this chain reaction of people it's like less theoretical, a little bit more about like who these people are and, and and what choice they're they're given. Uh, and so, so I just think it's so cool, and I'm excited to play the game myself. Yeah. So speaking of which, I want to first of all uh, tell you where you can find the game. Um, you can find the game on Steam uh, for PC and Mac um, and itch.io. Uh, and you can also um, download it for mobile. It just came out on iPhone and, um, and like Android and Google Play. Uh, so you can download it there. It's free, 100% free play. Not an hour and change of your, of your day um, <laughs> playing this game. Um, you could linger with it a little longer or you could run, speed run through it and keep out in, in 45 minutes an hour. 
Um, and then um, you can find out more about the sweet projects called Rise Home Stories that includes a children's book, a podcast, um, a, a an interactive real estate, or an interactive experience called Still Estate, um, and a, an animated web series called Mine. And you can find that at risehomestory.com. And then I would just like to give a special shout out to Texas Housers for hosting us today. Um, especially the, the masters behind this whole event, Michael Deepend and Ben Martin. Um, and also to Don Henneberger and Karen Pop for believing in that home for the last, uh, the last two, two and a half years. Um, and finally, you can learn more about uh, Texas Housers and totally rad work that they do. My friends at Texas Housers at texashousers.org. Thank you both of you so much for joining this 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 stream. It's been so amazing to chat with you. You're not good. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. I only made it the entire time without that happening. So I appreciate it all. And um, it was really awesome hanging out with you. And you can follow me, uh, Greg Got it if you're looking to follow more house policy or stuff like that. Evan, can we find you? Twitter and Mark, E-N-A-R-C. Cool. All right. Well, I'll catch you all around next time and have a good night.